Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What we're starting here is a series of 10 short lectures on Africa, African politics, and diplomatic understanding of Africa. My name is Stephen Chan. I'm the professor of world politics at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London where I was also the foundation dean of law and social sciences. I've been a dean at three British universities. And before that, I was very much involved in Africa as an international civil servant, working for the Commonwealth Secretariat and helping many governments come into independent existence, starting with Zimbabwe in 1980. I've been working in and wandering around Africa since 1979 and very, very much involved with the whole question of emergence from conflict, emergence into independence, and constructing or reconstructing governments. So starting with Zimbabwe, more recently, with the reconstruction of the governments in Ethiopia, and Eritrea, after the overthrow of the Stalinist dictatorship underneath Mengistu. Mengistu was a dictator supported by the old Soviet Union, whose troops were trained by the old Soviet Union. And the war of liberation that overthrew the Mengistu regime lasted for decades. So trying to reconstruct two countries in pretty much desolate ruins and turning them into something modern, in the case of Ethiopia, very successfully so, with becoming increasingly a high-tech country, that was a challenge. Other countries more recently, and always it's been not only a challenge, but a pleasure, because Africa is very, very much misunderstood in the world. I remember black American students asking colleagues, do they talk African in Africa? Well, no, they don't. They talk 2,000 different languages. That's not dialects, that's languages. So that comic book depictions of Africa, such as the Black Panther, are almost an insult to the multiplicity, diversity, and plurality of Africa. There, the characters pretend to be talking African, and they talk a blend of Xhosa, that's a Southern African language, suddenly breaking into Swahili, an East European language, and as if there were no difference between those two languages, just like there's no difference between Ukrainian and English. They're both European languages, are they not? So coming to understand Africa is something of a challenge for many, many people. It's a huge continent. And I think that's the first thing you've got to bear in mind. You can fit all of North America, that is all of the United States and Canada, fit all of Western Europe, plus Ukraine, fit all of India into Africa, and still have room to spare. It's a huge continent and the traditional maps don't do it justice. The scaling of those maps is incorrect. It's a large continent of great diversity and of great and very different histories. When you've got 2,000 different languages, you've got 2,000 ways of thinking, 2,000 different cultural backgrounds, and a diversity which even to this day is both rich, but also complex, and sometimes very troublesome. As I began preparing this lecture, the foreign minister of Ukraine was visiting Africa, and he began his visit with Senegal. And even in a highly intellectual country like Senegal, found many, many misunderstandings of Africa. But it was good that he began in Senegal because the founding president of Senegal, Leopold Senghor, had gone to study in France. And there, he not only studied successfully, but he gained the highest marks and the highest 
French exam. This French exam is called the aggregation. There's nothing else like this in the world. It's the most rigorous exam. He not only came top, he also came top in Latin. In other words, he became, in some ways, more French than French. The French made him a junior minister. They made him a member of the Académie Française, the highest intellectual rank in France. And to a certain extent, they were very pleased when he became president. And after all, they could say to themselves, we have a black Frenchman in charge of Senegal. Coming independence for Senegal isn't really cutting off Senegal. It's actually in some ways tying it more closely to us, to Mother France. Well, it didn't quite turn out that way, but it depicts different forms of colonial experience and formation, which I'll go into later, the French being one of them, one which emphasized higher education for the elites. In other words, try to bring them on side so they had a French formation, a rigorous French formation, and in the hope that this would bring them into some kind of lasting sympathy and collaboration with France. As I said, it's worked to an extent, but not entirely so. And we'll go into that in due course. But the foreign minister of Ukraine faced an uphill battle in going to Africa and calling on certain African states because the Russians have a very strong influence in Africa. Not only did they train at the dead of the communist regime in Ethiopia and in East Mengistu, but their aid projects are very significant. They trained many liberation leaders and commanders, propaganda degrees. Maybe there were propaganda degrees, maybe there were proper degrees, but I remember at a time before the independence of Namibia, a country that had been colonized by the Germans and then taken into colonial custodianship by apartheid South Africa, Development was so backward that there were only three Namibians who had doctorates. One had an American doctorate. He became the speaker of the first independent house of parliament in Namibia. Another had a South African doctorate. And the third had a doctorate from Patrice Lumumba Friendship University in Russia. And those were the most highly educated people in the country. And it also bespeaks the general, as it were, phenomenon of either very high education in some countries or very low education in others. When Zambia became independent in 1964, the founding president had to construct a civil service in which he could only field 92 university graduates. The British, who had colonized the country, had been so stingy in their recognition of the need of Africans for higher education that he only had a tiny cadre of people to administer at high level a very, very deep and complex country of 72 different languages. And Kaunda was ambitious so that many people in the West thought he was mad when one of the first things he did was to establish a national university. He wasn't mad. He was being very, very wise, realizing that this country needed educated personnel in order to develop and to prosper in the future. I myself taught at the University of Zambia for two years. I lived in Zambia for five years. Among the exiled ANC, now the government of South Africa, but then they were an outlaw party in South Africa under the party. And we would regularly in Lusaka, the city, suffer commando raids from the white South Africans. I was part of the safe house network for the children of ANC senior personnel. If they would go down to South African assassination, at least the whole family wouldn't go down together. Because when these commandos came, there was no mercy. Anyone in front of them was shot. So, the traumas and the difficulties of many African countries in the face of a struggle for independence and what happened afterwards, that's profound. It speaks to the Ukrainian struggle for a genuine independence that is not subject to invasion by stronger neighbors. 
So there should be sympathy for your African friends and neighbors and a deeper understanding of them. A deeper understanding of them would mean that they would have a deeper understanding of you. So the foreign minister would not be confronted by falsehoods and half-truths when he made a visit to Africa. Because you have a small problem as Ukraine. You have only 10 embassies in all of Africa. There's now 54 different countries in Africa. So you've got 10 embassies. And four of those are in North Africa. In other words, part of the Middle East, as well as part of Africa, Algeria, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia. And the only ones in Sub-Saharan Africa, sometimes called Black Africa, are in South Africa, in Angola, in Ethiopia, in Kenya, in Nigeria, and yes, of course, in Senegal. All of these countries with different colonial experiences and different formations. Now, in fact, Ukraine has been involved in Africa, been involved in Africa well before the foreign minister's visit. In 2010, in South Sudan, one year before it became independent, national elections were being held. And this is part of the agreed process underneath a comprehensive general peace plan to lead to independence after a 50-year war of liberation on the part of the South Sudanese. Finally, a staged process towards independence was agreed, but the country was still very violent. Nothing worked, people with guns were everywhere. United Nations peacekeepers were trying to hold down some semblance of peace, not always successfully. But I was leading a team of election observers, and we were in Rumbek, or heading towards Rumbek along atrocious roads. Rumbek was where the War of Liberation started. Guns everywhere. Underneath the protocols for observers, the peacekeeping missions were meant to provide, as it were, shelter for the night. Well, in Rumbek, there were three peacekeeping camps. One was Chinese soldiers. No, they claim not to have heard of this protocol. One was for Kenyan soldiers with a long history of peacekeeping. No, they couldn't help, no matter what the protocol said. The third peacekeeping camp was actually occupied by a combination of Canadian and Ukrainian soldiers. So they gave my team shelter for the night. My team got the last remaining available beds, so I stepped on the floor. It was an interesting night. But I was struck in particular by the sheer professionalism of the Ukrainian soldiers. And that stuck in my mind. Here, we had a country, even then, much misunderstood, but very, very much a country which could feel professional soldiers who behaved in a rigorously professional but friendly manner. We shared beers with them, we laughed and joked with them before we tipped down for the night, I on the floor, and before we got on with our observation of the election the very next morning. So my first impression of Ukrainian military personnel at least is a very, very favorable one. Now, South Sudan gained independence only in 2010. So 2011, the elections towards independence in 2010, that's when I was there. So it shows that the process of independence in Africa is a dynamic one, a continuing one, and probably not yet a fully complete one. Somali land has a real claim for independent status to be a recognized state, a peaceful, well-run part of what is now Somalia, which is largely in chaos. They have democratic elections that actually work. They have a very fine university where I've sent my own students for their field work. There's all the attributes of a state that won't be given statehood. Because there's a fear of a multiplicity of states in Africa, already 54. As I said, Ukraine only has 10 embassies in all of those many, many, many countries. But it has a claim, as do the 
people fighting still for independence in the Sahrawi People's Republic, sometimes called by its older name of Western Sahara, and that's also claimed by Morocco. And what you have is division in African ranks as to how many countries there should be, and whether or not some claims to statehood should be recognized. In other words, some of the struggles playing out in Europe today are playing out, have been playing out in other parts of the world, including in Africa. How would the 2,000 different languages, meaning 2,000 different cultural groups, if not ethnic groups, become 54 countries? Well, this began with the Congress of Berlin in 1884-1885. Now, by that stage, Europe was pretty exhausted from wars within Europe itself, wars and trying to secure colonial empires elsewhere. The British had lost in the United States of America, for instance. The Americans had defeated the British in open warfare. The British were also very much extended in terms of their colonial adventures in India, in particular. They had waged war in China, forcing opium upon the people in China, imposing, along with other foreign powers, what the Chinese have called unequal treaties, leading to, again, what the Chinese call a century of humiliation, from which it is rising quite dramatically at this moment in time. But with the exhaustion of Europe and the overcommitment of Europe in 1884-85, the European powers simply decided that Africa is not worth fighting for. Let's sit down and agree at diplomatic negotiations how to divide the continent. And that's why when you look at a map of Africa, it's not so many straight lines. And they couldn't agree, they simply drew a line down the middle. So these are artificial boundaries. It was quite, as it were, carelessly done in so many ways. It did speak to missionary and trading influences there beforehand, but basically it was done in a cavalier fashion. The political cartoonists of the day described it as carving up Africa as if it were a Christmas pudding over Christmas. And indeed it was Christmas and New Year and Africa was divided. Now, the interesting thing is that when independence came, and this really began in 1957 with Ghana, and then a whole float of countries began gaining independence in 1960 and throughout the 1960s, you had a decision to keep the colonial boundaries. And this is because of a recognition of economies of scale. The national struggle for independence had been fought within those boundaries. New national identities have been formed in the struggle for independence. But chiefly the economies of scale, you can't have 2,000 different tiny little states. The Europeans found that for themselves when in 1648, after the 30 years religious wars which had divided all of Europe, militarized all of Europe, they had negotiations at Westphalia. And the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 was attended by 140 states, some big, many very, very small. When you look at Africa today, you don't see such small states as you see in Europe still. Angora, Liechtenstein, San Marino, these are the survivors of that era of tiny little states. So you couldn't possibly have a Europe that could cooperate together with such tiny states. You couldn't have a Europe that could form itself as it has now into the European Union, composed only of tiny states. Economy of scale allows public administration of an effective nature. It also allows statehood in terms of a projection of itself, in terms of international personality, and the desire to cooperate with other states that are equal in terms of power, influence, and also in terms of capacity and potential. That's what Africa is aiming for. That's what the African nationalist leaders accepted. It's been largely successful. By and large, Africa has stood by the colonial 
boundaries. But it wasn't really just that that brought Africa into international relations. Many people forget that Africa had a long prehistory. What you had, for instance, were the visits of the Chinese admiral, Zheng He, in the 14th century. He took home a giraffe to impress his emperor. He got it home safely. We don't know how long the draft lived after the long sea journey. Chinese boats were not particularly comfortable. But he made several visits to what is now Tanzania. And in fact, even now on the beaches of Tanzania, even the beaches just outside Dar es Salaam, the capital city, you can find remnants of Chinese porcelain and Chinese crockery from that era. Uh, he got on very well with the locals, for the simple reason that he was not belligerent, he was not there on a colonial mission, but also because he himself was Islamic, and East Africa was Islamic at that point in time. So what you had pretty much was Islam making inroads into Africa from the 7th century onwards. But you have a long history even before that. Everyone's heard the story of Solomon, the king of Israel, he gave Israel, after King David, its first capital city with a temple, and the temple with the unifying device. Look, we're civilized, we have a city, we have a kingdom, we have a religion, we have a temple. All of these things are united artifacts of what it means to be a kingdom, a coming of age. Well. Two stories pertain to this. The first is that King Hiram of neighboring Lebanon, wanting to help Solomon, sent the cedars of Lebanon down to help build the temple. Non biblical accounts suggest that Hiram's ships, together with Solomon's personnel, conducted international trade as far afield as Indonesia. That's quite a distance, particularly in those days. The other story, of course, is that Solomon was visited by the Queen of Sheba. And in a biblical account, she wanted to marvel at Solomon's wisdom. He was meant to be the wisest man on earth. Well, in Ethiopia, they claim Sheba as theirs. There she's called Magda. And in the Ethiopian accounts, Magda or Sheba, went not to marvel at Solomon's wisdom, she went to test his wisdom against hers. She thought she was wiser. And when Solomon was reputed to be able to talk the language of animals, she, it was claimed, to talk the languages of both the birds and the fish. Both had a botanic influence, and also a zoological, as it were, interest. But the wisdom of Magda or Shiva, that's depicted on street paintings everywhere you go in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. So take home some of these street paintings. Your embassy there should perhaps provide some for the National Art Gallery in Kiev. But what you have also in Ethiopia were two things that were exceptional. And you'll also get street paintings of this. And that was the great Battle of Adwa of 1896. It was at the Congress of Berlin. The one European power that missed out on the spoils of the division of Africa was Italy. Everyone had gotten their own fair share, but Italy took some time to become united. Even now, there are still tendencies towards more statehood mentalities in different parts of Italy. But Italy felt aggrieved when finally it got its act together. And what a part of Africa. They thought Ethiopia, no one's taken Ethiopia. We can easily muscle into Ethiopia. We've got a modern army now. Well, it wasn't as easy as the Italians thought. At the Battle of Adwa, as I said, 1896, the Ethiopian army met the Italians with 80,000 rifles. That's the Ethiopians having 80,000 rifles. So 40 artillery pieces. The Italians did have more cannons. 
5,000 mounted cavalry with spears and swords, and 20,000 foot soldiers with spears. They defeated quite comprehensively the Italians. They had female commanders as well. The Empress herself led the guerrilla fighters to sabotage Italian supply chains. Now what is remarkable about, about the paintings uh, is not really the depictions of the battle, but in the heavens, the angels and the saints, particularly Saint George, they ride with these Ethiopians, and they're black. Well, of course, Jesus himself was not the white man that Americans in particular paint him as. He was pretty Middle Eastern. But what you have are not only the saints riding in the heavens with the Ethiopians. We have on both sides, both the Italian side and the Ethiopian side, casualties being evacuated to Red Cross tents. And this is because Ethiopia, with its Coptic church, has the oldest Christian liturgy on earth. It's slightly older than the Roman Catholic liturgy. It's probably the closest we have remaining on earth today to the way that the apostles worship. So they regard themselves as true participants in history. Because the Christian nation with monasteries, they had geese as a written language, like Latin in Europe. They considered themselves fully, fully civilized, descended from King David's through King Solomon himself. Solomon through Sheba, the two of them had a love affair after all. So they were never colonized. The Italians came again, again not fully successfully in World War I, World War II, but the Ethiopians maintained their independence, and for a very good reason that Ethiopia's capital city, Santa Ababa, is the headquarters of the African Union. That began life as the Organization of African Unity. But from a very early stage, African countries tried to find some form of cooperation. So having an embassy in Ethiopia means that the Ukrainians could have an ambassador not only to the Ethiopian government, but also to the African Union, also to the economic community, of Africa, which is headquartered there, and the African Development Bank, which is headquartered there. In other words, it's a very wise choice because it allows Ukraine to spread its influence far and wide throughout Africa by having, hopefully, a large embassy in Ethiopia. But you'll remember, ladies and gentlemen, that when the war in Ukraine began after the Russian invasion, Many African countries were very disinclined, very, very hesitant about condemning the invasion. This is because they had accepted Russian propaganda. There weren't enough Ukrainian embassies to counter that propaganda. And because of Russian aid projects. So you had a real problem. A tiny handful of countries did understand what was going on. The newly democratic government of Zambia under the Itaka Indi Hichilema not only was sympathetic to the position of the Ukrainians, but was vocal enough so that President Zelensky and he had a personal telephone call in which President Zelensky thanked President Hichilema. But they've done quite some remarkable things in Zambia. The founding president, Kenneth Kaunda, not only established university, many other great things, uniting a nation of 72 different languages. But when he fell from power, the people of Zambia rose up after seeing the fall of the Berlin Wall in 18, 1989. And in 1991, when the Soviet Union was dissolved and modern Ukraine came into existence as a fully independent state, the people of Zambia also successfully demanded that Kaunda stand for election in a proper democratic competition, and he lost. 
So democracy came in 1991 to Zambia, and it's been a genuine, sometimes problematic, but a genuine democracy ever since. But the previous government, the one before Hichilema, was very, very careless and reckless in accumulating international debt as well as domestic debt. But a huge, huge international debt. And the negotiations, first of all, with the IMF, um, more latterly with the independent creditors underneath IMF as its were principles, have been a masterpiece of negotiation. Quite frankly, after the war is over against the Russians and the Ukrainians need to rebuild, Ukraine could learn from the negotiating tactics of Zambia in terms of how to handle the huge debts that are in the process of being amassed. You could learn from sometimes the most as it were, unlikely places. Only there are many more of these places in Africa than meets the eye. So Africa is not just, as it were, a problematic continent. It's a continent of great potential and of great accomplishments. West Africa, with the great cities built by Islamic migrants, great stone cities, Mali, capital city Timbuktu, attacked by fundamental Islamists in recent times, was home to one of the world's great universities. One of the world's greatest libraries was housed in Timbuktu. What you had in many parts of Africa was deep learning, not in all parts, but certainly enough to take away the impression of an ignorant continent. And of course, even in southern Africa, you have the great stone city of Great Zimbabwe, probably established in the 9th century AD. Stone cities, stone temples, a whole chain of these stretch across Zimbabwe through the Mozambique, and obviously stopping points for traders going to the sea. So as I said, deep histories, not all recognized by the colonial authorities. After 1884, 85, formal colonialism moved in, in force with different patterns. Some of these patterns explain why different parts of Africa are so different today. The French, as I said, had a model of cultivating the elites, bringing them up to the highest possible level. Even a black man like Franz Fanon regarded internationally as the apostle of violent resistance to colonialism, someone from Martinique, a Caribbean French territory, but who was educated in France, was not only a brilliant academic and scholar, adopted by intellectuals and philosophers like Jean Paul Sartre, who wrote the preface to Fanon's great work, The Wretched of the Earth, Dominated at Pair. But he also took a medical degree in France, took a PhD in psychiatry in France, was greatly influenced by French thinkers, and fought for France against the Germans. Because what you had was a recognition, even by the most ardent nationalists, that not all of Europe is bad, you yourselves know that. but that life underneath the fascists, underneath the Nazis, would be worse than anything else. So he fought for France, he was wounded, he was decorated for valor, and yet he resisted French colonialism. That kind of contradiction is something which speaks to an African experience. Less so in other places. The Portuguese tried to emulate the French model Many black African students, particularly at the University of Lisbon. But there you had a difficulty in the sense that Portugal, right up to the mid-1970s, after World War II, was essentially a fascist dictatorship in its own right. Crypto-fascist, if you like. 
And the Salazar regime was determined to hang on to the colonies. Conscription was very, very unpopular. People didn't want to fight in the colonial wars. The black African students who went there to study in Lisbon greatly influenced the young Portuguese students. So that in 1974, what is called the Captain's Revolution, or the Carnation Revolution, the revolution where young officers, young captains, rose up and overthrew the Salazar dictatorship, they had been philosophically and ideologically influenced by their African student colleagues. People like Cabral, who led the liberation struggle in Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde, was a great influence upon the young captains. So education has, as it were, two sides to the sword, obviously. Now the British had two separate models. In the eastern part of Africa and the southern part of Africa, where there was very fertile agricultural land, settler colonialism was the way that a colonial model was put forth. We take the land and we don't educate the natives because they're only going to be workers for us as we own the land. They couldn't do that in West Africa. Too many wannabe settlers died of malaria. So there they decided to cultivate the local elite. In West Africa, and with the exception in East Africa, also of Uganda, they found kingship societies. And so they applied the model that they had used in India with the Rajas there. Take the local rulers, get them on side, give them British aristocratic titles to suggest that we recognize that you are indeed aristocratic. So many knighthoods were given in Uganda and in Nigeria to bring people on side. Universities were built in those places. The great university, Makeri in Uganda, Ibadan in Nigeria. These were meaningful universities that were very, very much spoken of highly in the international university press. But for the most part, the British mode of colonialism centered around violent settler colonialism, which is why the most savage wars of liberation were fought in Kenya in East Africa, the so-called Mau Mau uprising, and in Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, against apartheid in South Africa, and of course against the Portuguese in Angola and Mozambique. Those two countries, along with the other Portuguese territories, gaining independence a year after the Capitalist Revolution in 1975. But it took Zimbabwe from 1980, after a protracted war of liberation of great violence, and as part of the process of bringing that country to independence. South Africa, after incarcerating him for 27 years, finally released Nelson Mandela in 1990, partly because of the defeat of the South African army in Angola by a Cuban army. At the Battle of Quito Carnavale in 1988, the South African government was overthrown by an internal upheaval. And in 1989, the new president, de Klerk, took office. And in 1990, after consultations with President Kaunda in Zambia, released Nelson Mandela. But what you had very, very much was the four years of negotiation before apartheid came to an end and a constitutional majority rule country emerged in South Africa. That's very, very recent history. Now, the question is, with this very recent history, countries gaining independence for the most part in the 1960s, well into the 1970s, 1980, right up to the 1990s. The question is, actually, it's a wonder how well they've done in such a short time, particularly given how in so many circumstances the colonial authorities did not prepare themselves, did not prepare the African people properly for self-government, for independence. And if the British were bad from time to time, the Belgians were the worst. 
the terrible looting and exploitation and discriminations in what was then called the Belgian Congo, for instance, resonates to this day where the so-called Democratic Republic of Congo remains almost ungovernable. Peacekeeping soldiers there, too. Not sure how many Ukrainians might be involved, but that is a way for Ukraine to stamp itself into the consciousness of Africa by being involved in things like peacekeeping, knowing that Africa is not the only place on Earth where violence is visited upon countries wishing to be peaceful and wishing to develop in their own way. So ladies and gentlemen, what you have is political transformation of a very condensed nature. The borders of the day being agreed by colonial authorities only in 1884-85. Not even a century later, independence starts to come. It's still coming. It's not yet a completed process. Some spectacular success stories, some terrible non success stories, some long history, which we often don't know about, and a huge landmass which has not yet been fully utilized. There's much that Ukraine could benefit from by investment in Africa, cooperation in Africa, projection of soft power like scholarships to Ukrainian universities, for instance, for African students. That costs very little. Some of that has happened. More of it should happen. In other words, Ukraine needs to project itself. It can't be a country just by itself. It's needed international support to be able to fight against the Russians. The international community has been spectacularly impressed by the heroism, the sheer ability, the sheer strategic wisdom of Ukrainian military advances, military capacity. All of that has written Ukraine into a favorable location in East and Western eyes. It could be more so in African eyes, which is the task for Ukrainian diplomacy today. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that first lecture. We'll go on and develop some of these themes in future lectures. And as you can see, I'm trying to locate all of these, not only in terms of understanding different aspects of African modern political history for the most part, but also in terms of relationships that could be of benefit to Ukraine. So thank you very, very much, and I hope to be able to see you next week.